All right, good morning, everybody. You guys enjoying the camp so far? Good. All right. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a project I just recently uh, completed. Although, as as you'll find out, it's not complete, as it, very few products or projects are ever truly complete. But uh, zero code to Drupal product in 59 days. Um, first of all, as an introduction, my name is Bob Kepford. Um, I've been doing Drupal development for about going on five years. Um, I work currently for Fresno Pacific University uh, up in Fresno, California. Um, I also do some light consulting work. Uh, my company's named Kicktron. Um, I also have a weekly Drupal newsletter called the Weekly Drop. If, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. <laughs> so if you are interested in Drupal and being here, you probably are. Um, it's a good resource. It's free uh, weekly newsletter. You just uh, get one email a week and uh, gives you a rundown of all the important things that happened in Drupal that week. So, plug is over. I highly recommend it. And uh, <laughs> as I said, I work for Fresno Pacific, um, and I don't live in Fresno. I live in this tiny little town, uh, probably none of you have heard of, called Carruthers, California. Anybody? Familiar? So, if you've drove by Carruthers, California, the sign from the highway leads you straight past a gas station that has this uh, nice little landmark on it. And that's what that's kind of the claim to fame for Carruthers, although we do have a great little fair, but it's a, it's a small town. Uh, but I say that to uh, say this, that 59 Days of Code is a competition uh, for developers that is based out of Fresno. So anybody in like the greater Fresno County area, a couple counties around there, is eligible to compete in this competition. And I think it's this was the third or fourth year that we've done it. Um, and last year, I was actually a volunteer. It's a, to explain what it is, it's basically a hacker competition. Um, but unlike a lot of coding competitions you may have heard of before, the pri it's not just about the code you write. It's actually about the business model, uh, what your plans are with, after the competition. And so the judges not only base their decision on the code you write and how great your app works, it's also, is this going to make money? Are you going to get investment? How are you going to sell this to investors? Whatever your business plan is, you have to have one or you're not going to win. You can have a great app, but if you don't have any way of making money, you won't win. And so um, last year I was part of a volunteer and I kind of was a, I call myself a code cop. I basically made sure people, people are required to check the code into GitHub periodically and we were making sure that they don't cheat. So pulling in huge amounts of code when they started the competition tells us that they didn't start with zero code. So there's two categories, um, zero code and in progress. So zero code means you come into the competition on day one, you haven't written one line of code. That doesn't mean you can't use Drupal or WordPress or Rails or Django or some other framework. It just means that you couldn't have actually started working on your app before the competition. And so I obviously use Drupal for my project um, but there are other com competitors that were in the in-progress category. So they had an app that they had worked on previously, but they haven't launched yet. So it might have been something sitting on the shelf for a year or two, a side project that they never launched. And so there was two, these two different distinct categories. Um, and the cash prizes were uh, around 10000 and probably 20000 more in like web hosting and a bunch of really cool stuff. And so all that's really great. Spoiler alert, I did not win the competition. Competition is extremely uh, stiff. Uh, the guy that won actually won last year, really smart Rails developer, um, and uh, but I, I, it was very good. And I had I had some specific goals going into the competition. Actually, I thought you know long shot I might win, but I have other goals in this. I you know as probably most of you are in here are interested in developing products or something that makes recurring income. That's probably a goal of yours or an interest at least. And that was kind of my goal. If I won this competition, great. If not, this kicked my butt into gear to actually write some code and get something done and get a ball rolling, which is really the hardest part of anything is just to get started. And so, you know, as getting a bunch of cash is a great, um, that wasn't my end goal. My end goal basically was to create products. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I've been doing work writing a lot of code for other people for years, and I've never really written much for myself. One of the first things I actually have done for myself is the weekly drop, which is more of an experiment. Never was like planned to be like something to bring in revenue and support my family with, but it's, it's, an, it's a nice kind of an exercise for me 
as well as something a way to give back to the community. But I wanted to really like learn a lot about how to develop a product, and this competition was great because the judges are experienced developers and, and owners of startups and things like that. So I learned a lot doing the competition. But recurring revenue, ob obviously, with a product, um, I mean, I'm not interested in seeking investment. Um, I'm, I'm more of a bootstrap type. I, I don't want to take out loans or anything like that. I just want to develop it with the cash I have and the time I have. And I'm not interested in having employees. And I think a lot of folks in the Drupal community want to develop, want to start a shop. And that's kind of a different thing than what, what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about today is you're a solo entrepreneur, you're a developer, and you're maybe tired of just writing code for other people. Maybe you'd like to develop an idea that you've had into a product. And so this is the formula I'm going to talk about, basically. Um, this is an approach that, that I didn't come up with, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce the guy that, that, that has kind of brought this together in a second. But the idea is find a market. So I'm going to talk about niche products. So first of all, you, you, before you come up with an idea for something to write using Drupal, you come up with a market, a warm niche. The idea is a market like, say, a hairstylist. Say your, your cousin is a hairstylist. Well, that'd be a great area to look at because you know somebody in, in that industry. And so you find an industry, first of all. And then once you find an industry, you, you figure out how can I market to this industry? Do I have contacts with them? Are they online? Can I Google uh, these terms? You know, are they, are they actually using Google? And there's some things that I'm going to show you in a second that will uh, that'll make that make more sense. Once you find a market, once you figure out, the, like, is this a market I can actually reach? Then you go to the design phase. Like, I'm going to design a product. I may, may write up some UI mock-ups. Then you actually step forward and go to code. Now, if, if most of us in here probably have written code in our lifetime, and that is probably step one for most of us, including myself, which is a good way to make a really cool thing that no one will ever use or that will never make you any money. So that's why it's further on down the list. Step five, launch then automate. So the idea is I, don't, I, want, I want to develop more of these. I want to develop something that will scale as a one person deal. I don't want to necessarily have to hire five people to make my idea work. So that, that was kind of the formula I used and my approach. I didn't want to build the next Facebook. I didn't want to build you know, a web hosting service like Pantheon that would require 20 or 30 employees. I want to develop something I can manage myself. I can outsource maybe to get a little bit of help, but something I can do while I have a day job. So that, this whole approach has kind of been developed by a guy named Rob Walling. He's a, a, a developer, longtime developer, very successful guy. You probably never heard of him. Um, but he's got a great book called uh, Startup, it's called Start Small, Stay Small. I definitely recommend it if you're interested in developing products to check this out. It's a quick read. He is, uh, he talks about SEO and some stuff like that. But what I really like about him is that he, he's a developer, first of all, so he understands kind of where we're coming from. Second of all, there's no BS. Like, he just cuts it straight. Like, he's not going to tell you you're going to be a millionaire in, in, you know, two years. But at the same time, he gives you a lot of helpful tips. So I definitely recommend any of these resources if you're interested in this at all in developing a product. So my product is called Open Association, and the idea is it's a, it's a hosted web service similar to something like Squarespace but uh, or something like you know uh, any number of Drupal products that are like this um, Drupal Gardens for example uh, but the idea is that this is marketed towards a certain niche right so as I already said the first step is find a market so my market kinda just came to me I recently took over hosting about 10 or I think about 10 uh, police association websites from another Drupal developer from this area and so uh, I already, I basically wanted to develop an installation profile to manage those sites and something that they would all be on the same code base and make that easier. And so when the competition came around, I thought, you know what, I'll just, this will be my competition. Let me see if I can actually turn this into a product instead of just a project and see if I can actually market this and make some more money. And I quickly discovered that police officer associations aren't an easy group to market to. However, they have a lot of things that are similar with other group association, other types of associations like homeowner associations and, and teachers associations, things like that. And so I decided I'm going to broaden the scope of this a little bit. I'm going to still keep it in that association niche, but I'm going to basically try to figure out if I can market to these folks. And so uh, 
using some of the techniques in Rob Walling's book, I basically figured out that this is, this, there, is a, there is a market here that's large enough to sustain the type of product that I'm trying to develop. Um, as well as I have 10 police officer associations already as clients, already could be beta testers and, and possible uh, customers. Um, as well as this is something that I could use, you know, the techniques of basically blogging and, and SEO to reach this market, as well as trade magazines and things like that. So there's a, there, there's a marketing, a solid marketing approach I can take to get people to find out about my great Drupal product. They, these folks probably won't know what Drupal is, and they don't need to know. They don't even need to care. They basically want a website, and I can provide that for them at a, at a monthly fee. So the product that I developed in 59 days, uh, basically it's called Open Association. Uh, here are the key features. You have drag and drop content, uh, flexible page layout so you can Decide what at each page that you're on, you can decide which layout you want to use. Um, you have a news or a blog type feature. You can post your events. Um, you can post videos, maps. You can do forms and surveys, as well as it, it's set up right out of the box to uh, be mo mobile ready. And uh, there's just a quick slideshow. So the idea of being able to drag your content around the site to, to move from one region of your page to another is, is really easy. And, the, and it, during the competition, this was really the thing that, that when I, because during the part of the competition, it's you actually demo this on a, on a floor, showroom floor, in front of actual people interested in being clients. And so you can, you can see that you have different layouts you can choose from. So it's really cool. And I, I will talk about like the, the tech behind this and what modules I'm using here and all this kind of stuff at the end. But it's really important to remember that you need to think about marketing. I know we don't hear about that a lot. It's not something that comes natural to, that natural to me. I like writing code. But if you want to ever move from the point of being a coder to owning your own business and making money every month that doesn't require an equal amount of hours, you have to start thinking about marketing and how you're going to reach people. That's a, and it's an important step to take. And you can't shortcut it. You really do have to learn some of this stuff. So the other cool thing is it that the service is, is mobile ready. So when they create a site, they have a mobile site. So it's, it's using responsive design um, so that the, the site just flows and the content flows and it responds to whatever device you're on. So that's kind of the, the, the things that I was able to come pull together using Drupal, using contributed modules and, 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 and my own coding in 59 days. And I, I say in 59 days, in truth, it was more like 14 days because I signed up for the competition while I had some consulting work I did, hadn't, that went long. So I ended up having 14 days to do what I did, which was stressful. But it just shows like most of the other competitors kind of said the same thing. It's more like 14 days of code. It's more like the other part is the planning than the last 14 days is actually implementing what you're, what you're doing. So after, 14, after going forward, what I'm going to do basically is provide more themes, Facebook integration, um, Twitter integration, newsletters, uh, private content, and event signups. So we haven't got to really Drupal yet. So that's kind of like the sales pitch that I made to the, the, the competition. So why Drupal? You could do this type of thing, say, with Ruby on Rails or, or any number of frameworks. Um, first off, I know Drupal. So also... A lot of us think of Drupal as a content management system, but for a long time, I think a lot of developers have been saying that it's more of a framework, and I think it's becoming more accepted that that's the reality. And the tr that, truth is, that's the way I use Drupal. Every, every client that I work for, every employer I've had, they all want their customized CMS. They really don't care that it's Drupal. They want it to work the way they want it to work. And Drupal differs from WordPress and some other systems in that you can actually really customize the experience on the user end. You can change, you can customize the workflow so that it goes from point A to point B before it's published. You can do a lot of stuff. You can do a lot of customization. And so that's, that's basically the main reason I'm using Drupal is that it is more of a framework. I could, I probably could do something similar in WordPress, but I don't know WordPress. So the, the, the technologies that, or the, the modules I should say, that I'm using here Primarily are, as far as the, the, the UI uh, and being able to drag your content from one region to another, are panels and 
I'm I'm kind of kind of been an anti panels guy for a long time. If you're familiar at all in the Drupal world, there's kind of been a debate for a long time whether to go use the context module or the panels module being very different. And I've always been more of a context guy because the panels UI has always been something that I would never turn over to a client. And the context UI is also something I'd never turn over to a client, but it's a lot easier to manage. And, and usually for what I'm wanting to do, it does what I need to do. That is until the panels in place editor came out not too long ago. And at DrupalCon, I think it was DrupalCon Denver that I first saw the distribution Panoply. Um, and if you're not familiar with Panoply, uh, Panoply is basically what I'm doing. So Panoply is, a, is an install profile that was developed by Chapter 3. Um, and they also, the same folks that, that founded uh, Chapter 3 also were in a company called Pantheon. And they developed an uh, install profile for UC Berkeley called Open Academy. And so Open Academy allowed the UC Berkeley to quickly launch department websites very quickly and allowed them to have the admin on the site to have the ability to change every page's layout. So each page can have its own custom layout. Each page has uh, a myriad of different layouts. You can drag blocks of content, node content, all that type of information all over the page to different regions, and it doesn't require a developer. And it's really, really awesome. I highly, highly recommend you check it out. Um, go to just Google Drupal uh, uh, Panoply. And, and, and use Pantheon as a way to demo that. The Pantheon service is probably the easiest way to get up and running to test it out. So my initial plan with, with 59 days of code was to basically extend Panoply. So to use that install profile as they recommend on the site as my kind of starter to build what I wanted to. The problem is that I'm using another uh, uh, project called Agar. And Agar and Panoply don't necessarily play that well together yet because of some things with Drush. So I ended up taking a lot of the functionality modules and stuff out of Panoply and building my own install profile so that I could actually have something to demo for the competition. And so how many of you are actually familiar with the Agar uh, project? So, okay, this is a couple. So, so basically, Agar is a way to manage multiple Drupal websites um, on a server. So if you have four or five Drupal websites and they're all on the same server, and you need to update to the latest version of Drupal, that process can be very time consuming. Also, that process can be fraught with disaster if you're not careful. Um, and so, Agar is basically a way to make that process a lot easier. So, it makes backing up, deploying, updating, all those type of things easier. And so, if you're going to develop a product where you want to be able to roll out new sites very easily without any interaction on your part, Agar is a great, great tool. Um, I, I've used it at both my last two employers. Um, we had, you know, at Fresno Pacific, I think we have uh, 10 to 15, I think about 15 different websites right now, and they're all basically managed by Agar. So whenever a new version, I need to do security updates, it's a few clicks, and I have updated my, all my Drupal sites. So it's, it's super for that. And so that is a key tool that you could, you could look at using if you want to develop a product. You could also look at something like Pantheon. I mean, there, there. Are, if you if you can, it wouldn't work for for my 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 uh, needs. Something like a hosted service like Pantheon works great, um, and I'd highly recommend their stuff. So, a um, few resources if you're interested in researching further and like product development in Drupal. Uh, one one guy that uh, named Scott Hatfield um, has developed a thing called Wedful, which is basically very similar to what I'm doing, a lot more basic and really good idea, basically built a Drupal platform for folks that want to have a, a website for their wedding. So I have a wedding coming up, I'm getting married, and I need a website, you know, because I want, I want to be able to post pictures and all that kind of stuff, I want to have my own website. So he offers a service, so you just go there, sign up, you pay a flat amount for a year, and then you click through and you have a site, and you can pick different designs and stuff. And he's using Agar on the back end, just like I am. Um, and so, it, and he has a whole series of articles on uh, on how to do that and how he's done it. And uh, I haven't, I, I've been meaning to get in touch with him just to see how the business side's going. And it looks like he's doing really well with it. He's been doing, at it for at least a year now. Um, so that's a really good example of somebody who's using Drupal as, to develop a product. Um, Agar project, as I said, great for hosting. Even if you're not developing products, if you just manage a lot of websites, a lot of Drupal sites, it's an excellent product, excellent. Uh, 
I mean, it, it, it's so much easier. When I started using it, it was uh, it was pretty complicated. You really need to be a sysadmin. I'd still say you probably need to be a sysadmin, but it's getting a lot easier. So um, Panoply, as I said, it, a lot of the cool stuff that I'm using is, is Panoply is in that distribution. Uh, Git Pantheon, a great hosting service you might want to look at. Um, and again, I can't recommend it highly enough for Rob Walling's stuff. Any of the stuff listed, uh, I would highly recommend you check out. Um, just really good advice for, for launching a product and being successful. Um, and again, my, my newsletter, Weekly Drop. So any questions, um, if you have it, whatever the question is, it doesn't matter. Uh, it could be technical, it could be about something I talk about. Just shoot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't really talk about that. Sure. So features under uh, Drupal's not a CMS. So the features, as I'm referring to the features module. Um, so basically, if you look at most installed profiles, like say Open Atrium or Panoply, they they will package like a content type, some views, and different things into a feature module. And so that's what I'm doing with Open Association. It's basically, um, like, for example, the news feature is a, the news content type with along with a few views and a few other little things packaged up into a feature module. So what I can do is if I want to, say, add a new block view or a new listing of my news items, I can update that feature, and then I can deploy it across all the sites. So I can build I, – I can explain more of this – there's so many pieces with this. I really wanted to talk about kind of the the, uh, the business side of it and just kind of the approach of th changing the way you're thinking more than the technical side, but I'm happy to go into more detail if, if, if that doesn't answer your question. No, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you talk about being scalable and you kind of being able to manage everything yourself, and um, you know, obviously you're, you're going for like a very intuitive user friendly product. Mm -hmm. Okay, so also I don't think I mentioned this. I haven't launched yet. So, but so the question is, how do I manage support? Because as simple uh, as a U, UI as you make it, there are going to be people that are going to have trouble and they're going, going to need help, right? So, I will. I'm uh, I'm offering email support at a certain price point, which I didn't talk about pricing because I haven't launched yet. Um, but there will be three, at least three price points. Um, at the lower levels, you'll get email support with about a 48-hour turnaround. Um, at the highest level, you will get phone support. Um, so starting off, I'm probably going to handle email support. And also, like launching a product like this, um, unless you really spend a lot of time up front developing like a, 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 an email list, which I am doing, I haven't showed this yet, but and I should have mentioned this in the talk, um, but developing a mailing list before you launch so that when you're ready to launch, you shoot out an email to everyone that signed up ahead of time so you can actually have customers on day one. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And so I hope that my hope to my sales, my first day to be my best sales day ever for a long time. Um, all that to say this, like starting off, it will be small. There will be probably less than 10 clients. So that's good because I'm slow, hopefully, hopefully going to be slowly scaling this up. I, I'm not quitting my day job. I'm doing this on the side. So initially, I have myself and, and my spouse who is also going to be helping with e email support. Um, and at, at the point where that becomes painful, um, you, Rob talks a lot about in his book about outsourcing support. So you basically, every time you have a support email, you document it. And so that becomes a part of your documentation. And you set up a support email address. And at some point, you, you, you start working with outsourcers and, and folks that can handle email support. Um, and he, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not as knowledgeable about that area, but um, it's something that, that I'm, I'm learning as I go. So that's the plan, basically, is to outsource su support email and, and phone support. From the folks that I've talked to that have launched products, phone support is very rare that people actually want to get on the phone and talk to you. So if you offer a phone number, 
um, that really makes the purchasing decision a lot easier. Like people will will actually hit the buy button more often if they see a phone number, even if that phone number just goes to a voicemail and then you call them back or whatever. But very few people actually call. Of course, it would depend on the market. Like like if you're going for, um, you know, uh, whatever, what's the buzzword for high-end um, enterprise, which I'm not for that reason because one guy can't do it. Well, maybe he could, but it'd be tough. I'm not going for the enterprise market because that's what they're looking for. But for... Somebody that's running an association, it's a part-time thing for them. And the 10 clients I've had for like six months, I've spoken on the phone once, and that was initially with somebody. Everything else has been email support, and it's, they, their expectation has been pretty low as far as turnaround time, and I've exceeded the expectation. So based on that experience is what kind of what I'm basing, like my support need for support. That, I mean, that's the kind of way I'm approaching, just so email support to start out with. And I'll just learn as I go. Yeah. So they sign up for you, go on your website, and it's just hosted on the cloud, or they download this stuff? Yeah. So it is hosted. Let me uh, pull up the actual. So here is the sign-up page, which is not a sign-up page actually yet. Um, so the question is, how do they download it? Is it a service they download on, onto their server, or is it something they sign up for that's hosted in the cloud? It's hosted in the cloud. Um, Basically, if you're familiar with WordPress.com or, or Squarespace.com or Drupal Gardens, it's similar. You just go, you sign up. Uh, in fact, I'll show you really quick kind of an example uh, if I have it pulled up. Webful, Webful. All right, here we go. So it's very similar to, this is Webful.com, which is Drupal-based. So basically, once I launch, they will set up an account similar to this. And they'll they'll pick a theme to start out with, and they'll sign up. And then so then the the service is all hosted. They don't worry about anything. They just worry about their content. They cut. They can customize the site. Um, let me pull up the actual site. So uh, if you're interested on the back end, I can talk about like how I'm actually hosting it. But but that that's the answer. So, so um, they they get on there and they're free for thirty days. They or they pay right up front so they can get going. Or how they pay up so. I haven't decided whether we're going to do free for 30 days. I'm probably going to do free for 30 days. And then, but they enter. So the way I've seen it done that I think uh, works well for actually getting paid is a 30 day free trial, but you get their credit card number. So to sign up, you have to enter a credit card number. And I'm, all this is the stuff I'm going to test. So um, if you're familiar like with AB testing, um, that's the way I'm going to purchase it. At, at this point, I've been even testing like the sign-up page and stuff, like what works. So they would sign up, enter their credit card. They wouldn't be charged until the end of the 30 days. I'd send them a reminder saying, like, are you if if you want to cancel, you can cancel. If not, you're going to be charged in you know a week or whatever. You got to download the iPhone app, is that correct? No, no. So um, I'll just show it real quick. So basically, it's using responsive design. So it's it's basically using CSS3 media queries. If you're on an iPhone, it, the site essentially looks like this. I, I didn't have my, I don't have my, uh, I guess I could pull that up real quick. Yeah, I'll simulator here. But this is basically what it looks on a mobile device. So this, the site responds to uh, the width of the device. So, yeah, so th th there's no app. At some point, if this thing is successful enough, I'd love to have an iPhone, an Android app for content editing and that type of thing. Uh, at this point, um, you know, I'm really trying to be lean with how much time I put into this just to see, because because at this point I haven't made a dime off it, right? So the idea, like, you can over-optimize a product. You can spend, all, like, a ton of time making it great, and if nobody wants it or nobody knows about it, you've just sunk a ton of your time into something that may be great, but no one needs or no one wants. And so that's what I've been trying to avoid, because I have a lot of ideas about products, and most of them have never got to even this point because I found out like that they're going to fail. They're, by fail, I mean they're not going to make any money. Um, I have a really, I had a really great idea about a funeral home, like a funeral home CRM, because my cousin is a, owns a funeral home, right? And so he was complaining about the tools that they have to do their business. And then I, but I realized I don't have the money to market to that market because they're not online. So that's the thing to think about. Like you might have a great idea that would help people but you may not have the time or money to market to them. So anyway, any, any other, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing with the marketing right now? 
right now, right now this is like in hibernation mode until September. I'm not really doing anything for marketing right now. But to market this product, uh, initially, I'm doing word of mouth with the police associations in the state of California. Um, there's a, one of my clients has a, uh, a, basically a publication that goes across the state, and they have clients all up and down the state of California. Uh, also, so the, and the other uh, thing that I'm doing is, is I'd be developing a blog that is going to be basically, uh, there's a, basically be targeting folks that are looking at how to, how to, uh, how to promote their association. So SEO, basically creating articles about how do you, how do you, uh, how do you spread the word about your association? How do you communicate with your members? A lot of the type of stuff that we don't read as developers but the kind of stuff that if somebody is needing a website will need. So, and there's just, there's some tools in Rob Walling's book about like how, how to do that and how you can even outsource like the writing of blog articles and things like that. Yeah. So uh, I'm a police association director or whatever, and uh, I use your service. So I have all my members sign up as users on the service, so they're just anonymous users. I mean, what's the is that? So. What, basically, the way it would work is I'm the if, say I'm the, the decision maker. At the, so the question I need to repeat the question for the uh, for the screencast. Um, the question is: Association members, if they sign up for this service and their association is going to use the service, how do their members use the website? Um, do they go sign up at OpenAssociation.us? So if say I'm uh, Fresno County Sheriff's Office or whatever, and I create a site. So the decision maker, the person that has a credit card, they go online, they create the website. And then they let their members know, hey, we have a new website, we want you to go sign up. So they send them to the URL for their site. So each, each customer has their own U URL. So it might not even, it might be like uh, Fresno County Sheriff Office Association.com or whatever. So they send their users there and then they sign up as, as members of the site. So uh, basically, there'll be one admin on the site. So the person that makes the, the, the purchase, they actually have access to change the website around. All other users are just authenticated users that can post to the, the forum or they can, they can see their members' directory and things like that. Sure. Like if you use Drupal Gardens, for instance, uh, they have a link at the top that has like help and then you can do a tutorial on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. The question is like uh, tutorials on Drupal Gardens as an example of, of like support. So that, that's kind of what I meant by say I get an email with a support request saying I don't know how to edit my pages. So I'm going to basically populate a bunch of uh, video tutorials and text tutorials before I launch. But as you go forward, if somebody requests something, it's a lot of times it's easier to actually make a screencast than it is to write it up, um, and so that's one of the things I'm definitely going to be doing is is making support. That's what makes something like this a lot easier to do than say doing client to client to client, and all those different sites are different. When you have the same code base and the same functionality on every site, doing support for it is a lot more scalable, and, and you can repeat it and, and not. So an e a support email can actually be written once for one specific request and then just customize a little bit and they're you know they're makes it a lot easier. I mean Gmail is a great tool for that. Like there's some stuff with Gmail that you can just like boilerplate uh supporting. I actually use it a lot now already. Um so yeah. So have you ever thought about other types of advertising in there like uh you know during that thirty day trial maybe you want like the uh, janitorial supply company to market to these Police officers, yeah. Like that. So, the question was: Have I thought about asking or uh, including type of affiliate type stuff, like yeah, recommendations? Right, yeah. Well, yeah. You know, like uh, if you're marketing this specific industry, you might want to find other people that want to advertise to that industry. Sure. I haven't really considered that, but I, it, so no, I haven't really considered that, um, but. Along the same lines, I have thought about other revenue streams besides just straight. I pay forty nine dollars a month to use this service. So, um, but you know, it there like the the tough thing about about any of this on the business side is figuring out 
pricing structure, like what people are willing to pay. I know what my bottom line, like what the least I can charge is at this point. I mean, my get my best guess is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what people are willing to pay. They might be in, and it gets really crazy with, with what people are willing to pay. Um, and so there, then you start getting into the idea, well, how do I differentiate at the different price points? And, and one idea that's been suggested to me was at the lowest pri price point, they don't, they can't use their own domain. They can just set up, you know, my site dot open association dot us at the second, the higher tier levels, they can, they can bring their own domain and we, they don't, you know, similar to like Tumblr, well, actually Tumblr's free, but similar to like, I think Drupal Gardens, if, if you use a free account, you can't have your own domain, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that stuff, you know, that stuff is just like testing as you go, um, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm not close to a lot of these ideas. So, so that, that like, I've been thinking about different ways to bring in money besides, but the, initially, you know, that my main, my main thrust is just like how much are they going to pay to use this service? And I'm not going to have a free level um, at all. It's, it's going to be like you just pay because I'm not trying to build mass adoption. I don't really want mass adoption of people that aren't willing to pay a few bucks a month, you know, to use the service. So any other questions? Um, how, how much uh, time a week, uh, since you have a full-time job, do you spend on this? Do you get any sleep? <laughs> so... The question is, how much sleep do I get since I have a full-time job? So this is actually why I'm moving to the product side versus the consulting side. So right now, I haven't been working on This has been on the shelf since the competition ended, which was the end of June. So I haven't really done anything on it since then. Other than I'm actually using this distribution for other projects. So I've been eating my own dog food, in a sense. So I've been using this at Fresno Pacific, not not the branded side of it, but just you know the install profile, the Drupal part, um, because it's ju it's just really good and it makes my job easier there. Um, and at some point, I've considered you know actually just putting the whole install profile on Drupal.org, um, just because you know I mean I've released other things. I most of the stuff that I write that would make sense for other people, I do put up on Drupal.org as a project, but. Um, I, whenever I'm doing a consulting project and, uh, I don't get a lot of sleep because I have a deadline, right? So, and, and it becomes a thing where something happens and you get behind and then you have a contract and you have a deadline to meet. And so you don't get a lot of sleep. So I usually average about six hours sleep a night, but that's works for me. I've done that for years. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm tired of doing consulting work on the side. Um, I want to actually have something that's got some long, longevity. So I'm anticipating 8 to 10 hours a week on this after launch. So up in, I'm willing to do an extra 20 hours a week on this project until it launches, which I plan to launch before the end of the year. So it, I could launch it in its current state, but I feel like that would be, uh, there would be a lot of feature requests right off the bat that just make sense. And so... So I still have I still have some work to do, mainly in the um, in the area of uh, of the private content area, because most of the associations want to have their own kind of private walled garden where they can talk about stuff and discuss stuff. This is the things that you don't get with something like Facebook, you know, um, because people just don't you know, don't trust Facebook for privacy, and that's smart. So uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> so so how many of you are Currently developing products. I'm just curious. Well, I wouldn't call it a product, but it's not like this. It's not like a release that they Like, you know, a service mm -hmm. you would use, uh, but it's more geared for everybody. Okay. Well, is it like a product, just something people pay to use? I mean, versus straight consulting work, which is what I've done most the last five years, just building stuff for other people, which is fine, and I enjoy it, but after a while, it gets to be kind of like you're on, uh, you know, a hamster wheel, instead of something like you're not really building momentum. Like I, I only make money for the hours I'm working, or for when the project's done. Instead of, like, the idea that Rob Walling talks about is basically building a portfolio of products. And so, if if you want to quit your day job, that's one approach. But you could also do this as I am, like continuing the day job, and then and then having maybe one or two products like this that. Once you launch, once you get your support in place, you know, and outsource 
as much as you can that doesn't require you. I mean, out, even outsourcing the development, I mean, you don't even have to be a Drupal developer. There are plenty of people that develop products that don't write code. Um, in, some, in some ways, they're more successful because they're thinking about the business side more than they are the code side. And uh, it's amazing the successful products that are out there that are horrible because they're marketed well. Um, I mean, you just have to look, all you have to do is look at enterprise products to realize that marketing is like, if you want to make money, it's marketing. The product can be awful. But if you have a good product and good marketing, you have like Basecamp, right? I mean, you have these companies that have developed a reputation in the industry of developing great products and they have a, you know, a reputation. I'm not trying to be 37 signals, but at the same time, if, if, if I can, I have knowledge, I can manage projects, I can manage developers. So I, you know, you know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential here. It's just, you know, you have to be wired the right way. And it's a skill to learn. It's a new skill from, it's different from programming, but it's something that I think anybody in this room could, could probably do. It's just a matter of if it's something you would want to do, you know? So any other questions? What's, what's your uh, you know, Google uh, 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 yeah. And I'm going to post these uh, slides on the website, so you'll be able to look at those. And uh, I'm on Twitter and on Drupal.org and all the same username, Kepford. So, and definitely check out the newsletter um, if you if you haven't already. So, any other questions? Uh, theweeklydrop.com. Is that like about technical content? Yeah, yeah. So it's basically, it's a lot of it's developer stuff, but not all of it. So there are topics in there that, that are covered that are theming related. So HTML, CSS, and a little bit of PHP. So it's basically just a rundown. Uh, I mean, I, I know several people that are not developers but are just like content editors that use Drupal that are subscribers. Um, I don't know how valuable it is to them, but, but they, they seem to like it. Um, so, I mean, you can check it out. You can always unsubscribe. It's not a, you know, just check it out. If, if it's not for you, that's cool. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so we, we cover headlines. So the announcement of Drupal Con Sydney in 2013, different camps that are coming up, you know, that type of stuff, you'll get notified. The nice thing is it, it, it's, it's, it's not something filling up your RSS feed reader with 500 articles that you're, that, that type of stuff just drives me nuts. I like, I like to have zeros, everything zeroed out. And so email newsletters like this are great for me. Like I subscribe to a ton of them because it's got a curator behind it that actually goes through and reads and just posts the best stuff in a, in a, in a summary and just in one email and I can look at it. I can delete it. You know, I, I, it really appeals to me. It's not for everybody. It's a lot of folks, especially in the Drupal world are really hardcore RSS folks. Um, and I was for years, but it just got to be too much. And so uh, nobody was doing this for Drupal, so I just you know, decided to do it last year at Bad Camp, and uh, it's been pretty successful so far. So, All right. Any other questions? I'd love to hear more about the hosting setup. Sure. So going from the metal, like the server, up to actually what people see, I'm using cloud, um, Rackspace cloud servers. So um, I, I've been using Rackspace for three years now. Um, and so it's basically a VPS. If you're not familiar with Rackspace cloud servers, um, it's a scale. It's very similar to Amazon's um, web services platform. So you can, you can spin up servers, um, pay as you go. You only pay by the hour. You can, you can expand your resources like your RAM and hard disk space and things like that. It's really, it, it's really user friendly. Like Amazon is great. But Amazon is a much steeper learning curve, in my opinion, to get go up and going if you've never done that type of thing before. There are other, like you could use Amazon, you could use any number of other cloud providers. So I've been using them. I love that the whole aspect of like I'm only paying for a one gig VPS. And then if, I, if, if like traffic and I need more resources, for example, I can bump that up to two gigs and it's just a slider. Um, I don't have to reprovision a whole server and migrate. IP, you know, it, it's a lot easier process to upgrade. So that's 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 the server. Um, and then above that, I'm running um, Agar, as I was mentioning. So Agar, if you go to agarproject.org, you can find out more about that. And I'm actually using a uh, 
a different setup of agar called Omega. Well, it's called Barracuda. Um, and uh, there's a company called uh, Omega 8 that provides hosting for, for uh, of Agar instances. So you can, so you don't even have to like do any of this. You can just go to this website and set up an Agar server and, and pay them and they'll set it up. They'll, they'll actually do the sysadmin part for you. And I, I use them at Fresno Pacific. I, I uh, basically have a, 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 a support contract with them. And so whenever my server needs upgrading, they just do it because we don't have uh, a Linux sysadmin on staff. We have mostly Windows guys. So these guys, I can't recommend them highly enough. They're really great. Um, and so if you wanted to get going with Agar, you can try these guys out. Um, so Agar, I hesitate to see here. I have it pulled up. So Agar is what I use to um, manage my sites. So I have, this is, uh, this is one of my Agar servers, which this is all, these are all Drupal sites, right? And so managing the Drupal sites is, is pretty straightforward. So I can migrate this to another code base when I need to update like different uh, modules and things like that. I can do backups, I can delete the site, I can disable uh, without hitting the command line. I'm not afraid of the command line, in fact I prefer it, but the cool thing about Agar is that it uses um, Drush on the back end to provision your sites, download modules, update modules, and Agar is kind of like a front end for, for Drush. And so it's, it's got a little bit of a learning curve. I'd say if you're a system administrator, if you're comfortable setting up servers, you'll pick it up pretty quick. Otherwise, I would recommend going with somebody like Omega 8. Is that, is that something that hides from like, servers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Agar runs... You install that on your uh, Linux server, and then you can install Drupal sites with Agar. So instead of downloading Drupal yourself and then um, basically going in there and, and, and downloading your modules and everything, you basically use Agar to manage that site. Of course, you can go in the command line and download your code and set up your platforms. Um, Is that set up for like multiple sites with yeah. different modules installed? You know, like, like custom profiles or Yes. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the Barracuda version of Agar that Omega 8 maintains, um, which you can use for free. You don't have to use their service to do it, um, but they offer a really nice hosted service. Uh, you, can, you can set up, they already have like a bunch of profiles like Open, Open Atrium and, and Panoply all set up, it's ready to go. But if you want to do your own custom pro install profiles like I'm doing, you basically download all that stuff, you create the, the Drupal core code base, and then you can install as many sites on that as you want. And your individual sites can have their own modules that are just in the sites slash mysite.com folder. So does, that, does that actually install separate instances of Drupal, or does it run from just one code base? It, it can do either. Oh, yeah, so the, the way the, the workflow that I'm using is that I have different code bases per project. So un un unless I'm, I'm talking about open association, the product I'm developing here, there's one code base and there'll be multiple sites on that sing single code base. Then when I come out with a new release of open, a uh, open association, um, say it fix in a few bugs, I'll create a new platform, which is Agar speak for a code base. And then I'll migrate the sites from one platform to another platform. And so, and it's really straightforward to do. So you can, you can do one like as a, you can clone your site and it'll basically copy the database, create a new database, copy the sites and all the modules and everything, and then test it on the new platform. And if, if, it, if it works and you go in there and test and everything looks fine, then you can go and actually migrate all your sites in one click. So if you had 10 sites on one Drupal code base, then you upgrade it to the latest release of Drupal you can go in there, select all your sites, click migrate, then select where you want to migrate them to, and it'll basically just migrate them all, and it queues it up. It's it's really really slick, um, and there like if you just Google Agar and Drupal, there's a lot of good videos. Um, Omega Eight has some good videos on their site showing what you can do with it. So, so it's it's really slick. So that, do they allow you to have like different profiles? Yeah, yeah, you, you can have 
yeah, your custom profiles. You just have to download them, put them in your in your uh, in your uh, platforms folder in Anchor, and then and then and then you just basically go in and import create in the front end. You say, okay, here's a platform, here's where it lives, here's what I want to name it, and then then you can actually install sites on it. So and it's a really good project. I mean, it, it's different than say something like Pantheon, where Pantheon is designed to be. I have a dev stage live set up and I just have one site and it's all siloed, which is great. Like, so if you have a really, really high traffic site or you don't care about multiple sites, I would totally recommend Pantheon over Agar. But if you're someone like me who has 10 or 15 sites that are almost all identical, they just have different themes and a few different functionality, Agar is great. Because, and also I'm hosting it myself. So, so they're, they're, but yeah, so it just depends on what your, what your goals are. You know, and the folks at Pantheon would tell you the same thing, I think. So, all right. I don't know if anybody else is in here, but I think thank you all for your attention and uh, your questions. And uh, feel free to ask any questions afterwards as well. Thanks.